want to welcome everybody here tonight to Anchorage, Alaska, and we are teaching here live from um, Wellspring, teaching out of Art Matthias's book, Biblical Foundations of Freedom, which, tell me, could you grab me a book real quick? And um, so we are excited that we get to teach tonight, and I'm excited that you're here. If you are live, um, we're excited that you have tuned in, and we are, I'm just encouraging each one of you to know that if you, are, if you are online, that there is a purpose and a reason for you to be online and to stay online because God has something good for you. He wants to speak his love and his truth to you. If you want to grab me a book, that'd be great. Actually, there's not one. Oh, there. All right, so I'm going to open in prayer, and then Sean, I'm going to take that in just a second. So this is actually the book that we teach out of. Um, Biblical Foundations of Freedom, and you can see in the gold, it says, I found freedom, and that is exactly what each one of us who are sitting here in this room can say is the freedom that we found when we chose to follow God's way and to understand the biblical principles that are in the Bible and to be asking Holy Spirit to help us to be able to discern and to know his truth. So I'm going to open in prayer and then we're going to get started. Father God, we love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. And we thank you, Father. And we worship you and for being our God. Father, worthy is your son. And we thank you, Father, for this time. We thank you that we live in a free country where we can gather together. Father, where we can learn about you. Uh, we can um, be encouraged with one, by one another. Father, that we have relationships where it says in your word that um, iron strengthens iron, sharpens iron. And Father, that's your purpose. One of your purposes for us is that we sharpen one another. And it is through gathering together and encouraging and praying for one another and listening to testimonies, Father, that brings us um, refreshment and power. And so, Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for uh, your people, Father, who love you and are pursuing you. And, Father, I thank you for every person online and everyone who is sitting here. That, Father, that people are pursuing your heart. They want to know you. I ask that you would bless them and show them, Father God, the goodness of who you are. I open, ask that you would open the eyes of their heart to just know you in a very special, intimate way tonight. Father, may they see you in a different way. And we set this time aside for you and your purposes, and we bind the enemy in any way that he is trying to wreak havoc or confusion during this teaching. And we set this time aside. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here with us. And Father, we breathe in and we breathe out. And we love you in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. All right. Sean, did you want to? I, I just wanted to hear one good thing from you. Okay. You introduce it. Okay. Now. Okay. <laughs> Sean, I'll probably share a little bit of that later, okay? That's, okay. that's fine. I okay. was okay. All right. I was kind of curious, too. <laughs> um, so we um, are a community of believers here. Tonight, we come together every week, and we there is different teachers that teach out of the Biblical Foundations of Freedom, and we start at Chapter 1, and then we go through 13 chapters, and then we start all over again. So one of the things that happens, that uh, Toby's doing right now, is passing out um, a bookmark or any kind of scratch paper with pens. If you want to put the pens in here, Toby, that'd be great. And so that you can write down or jot down anything that God is putting on your heart tonight. So as being a former teacher in the public school system, that's one of the things that I learned was that what you hear you'll take away so much. But what you write and record, you take away probably, I think it's at least 50% more. 
So as Holy Spirit's talking to you or you have a question, please write it down and, and uh, you know, we can get together after, pray with one another, ask questions from one another, because that's um, what his kingdom is for, is for us to gather together, <coughs> talk about what God's doing in our life, and ask questions. And we know that Holy Spirit is our guide and our counselor. He leads us to all truth. And so tonight, as um, I'm teaching, that's one thing that would be really good is you is for you to ask Holy Spirit, you know, what do you think about this? Because I can tell you that I'm learning just like you're learning, and He takes us to all different levels. And so tonight we are going to be talking about the ministry of Jesus and and what all of that encompasses. Because that is a very important question, and that is, who do you believe God is? Who do you believe Jesus is? Because from all of that is how you will live your life, how you will respond, how you will react um, to your circumstances, your situations. And um, so when I first started coming here, um, I will have to tell you, even though I had known who God was and known through <clears throat> Jesus, um, I knew about him, but I didn't know him personally, like how I know him today. And there were so many questions and so much confusion that I have, but as I came here and I asked Holy Spirit to help me, he did. So uh, Jesus came to show us the Father, and in Colossians 1.19, I love this. It says, For God in all of his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And so that is a confirmation that Jesus is real. He's alive. He's God's son. And he had a purpose when he came here. God, they, God sent him for a reason. And that he is the image of the invisible God from Colossians 1.15. So we can define who God the Father is. Um, what his kingdom is and what his will on earth is by looking at his son Jesus. Um, another name that I will integrate and go back and forth is Yeshua. That's his uh, Hebrew um, name. That's his uh, actual name and what he did while he was here. So one of the things that is important is to be able to personally experience who the Father is. And um, what um, he has for us. It says in John 8, chapter 8, 31 through 32, it says, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. <clears throat> and so to know means to personally experience Father God. Robert. It occurs to me that the uh, title to personally experience the Father is what Yeshua did. Is that while he was yeah. walking, what Robert's yeah. talking about is that when Yeshua came, that's what he did is he personally experienced the Father mm -hmm. as he lived out his ministry here. That's good. Anything else? No. Okay. Well, one of the things I want to tell you is that my honey and I just celebrated our, we are now in our 17th year of marriage. And we have been together for 20 years now. And I have to tell you that um, I'm still learning about him. <laughs> Even after 17, 20 years, there are things about my honey, um, Dave, that are still new to me. That I get up and I get to know him in a new way, or I get to um, say, wow, I didn't know that about you. We were, um, got, we were able to... Dave, with Dave uh, we were together this last week, and he had the opportunity to speak in front of uh, a group, and there were things that he talked about that I didn't know about him. Well, that is the same parallel of our God in heaven. Our Father is that even no matter how long we've been walking with him, um, that he wants us to know him like that. He wants us to be discovering new things about him. And, the, and how do I know that about my husband is because I'm, I am in a love relationship with him. And because I'm in a love relationship with him, I respond to him in love. I want to be around him. I want to have conversation with him. 
Um, and so that's the same with our Heavenly Father. That's what He wants. He wants us to have that kind of an intimate relationship. He wants us to be pursuing Him and getting to know Him. Um, and the way that what Robert's talking about is when Yeshua walked on this earth that he personally experienced his, his father. And some of the ways he's, he did, as I studied about this, was that sometimes he would be alone with, with God, talking with him. And talking with God is praying. It's as simple as that. And so he would be alone with him. He spent regular time with him. <clears throat> Go ahead. So the first phrase up there, if you, if if you, you halt hold. my teachings, then you are really my disciples. So right. Yeshua held to the teachings of his Father, right. which were the Ten Commandments. Which so the Jesus Ten simply did the Ten Commandments. Right. And then Jesus was the disciple of Yahovah, or God. And he was saying that as I am to the Father, you will be, be to, to me. me. So hold to those commandments. Hold to those. And what... Um, when Robert just spoke about that, it reminds me that it, that word if, yeah. and as you are obedient to him, then God unveils another layer. He unveils a new part of him. As we are obedient to him, as we follow his ways, um, Robert said the Ten Commandments, as we follow them, then he shows himself. As we become intimate to him and we, re and we respect him, we, which is actually another name for fear of God is following him having reverence for him that as we do that then we create a very vulnerable intimate relationship it's the same that I have with my husband as I do that uh, Yeshua showed that he prayed in trust and <clears throat> that he prayed in prayer in praise and thankfulness that he was thankful that he demonstrated and spoke out about what he was thankful for and that, that how important that is. Sometimes he prayed short times. Sometimes he prayed long times. Right? So it's a big variety of different things. And he encouraged, I love this, he encouraged his disciples to never give up in prayer. Never to give up in prayer. And he took, and took his father wherever he went. And we take, we are, we are God's temple. We are his vessel. And so wherever we go, God is with us. Holy Spirit is with us. And he wants, and as we go, as we're obedient, and we strengthen that intimate relationship with him, it just flows from us. People, it, it, is, it is an attraction. We are God's advertisement. We are his advertisement. So as we pursue him, as we follow him, and when, if you hold, that means if you do it, right? You hold to my teaching, okay? It's about him being the teacher and us learning, but learning and doing. And that's what it means to personally experience him. And so through that, as we experience, as we experience Father God, is that's where our testimonies come from. And testimony that out of Revelation 12, 11 says, and they overcame him, who is him? That's the adversary, the enemy Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. And that word testimony means do it again. Do it again. So, um, you know, there's, you can hear a good story, and it'll, if you can remember a good story, but, um, you, and you'll remember it for a while, but a testimony stays alive. A testimony stays alive. And when you tell it again, it burns like the first time. When I talk about my journey and with uh, chemo it, and cancer, it burns alive in me. And the difference between a good story and a testimony is the power of God. Because as we speak his word, it is active and alive. His power still is for us today, and his, and his son's blood still speaks for us. Tell me. You know, I want to go to, um, in Revelation, it says um, that uh, we overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb. Well, you know, I never realized it. I was listening to something the other day. And Satan and the angels do not have blood. That's why they can do stuff 
they can do stuff, you know, uh, to to us, um, and they don't have a conscience. They have, they don't feel the same kind of things. They could kill someone, and oh well, they're just dead, you know. Oh, let's chalk that up to, to, but but because Satan doesn't have any blood, he doesn't have the feeling, feelings that we have. So the blood of the lamb is powerful. Um, mm -hmm. It's more powerful than we realize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was one yeah. of the th that was one of the pieces. That, well, one, first thing I want to say is that this is what I was talking about earlier. Was that gathering together that we get to listen to what people are learning about in our kingdom, and that we can go home and think about that. Think about what Toby's saying. Think about what Robert is saying because that's how we grow, you know. And we may or may not agree with that. And, but, but we all have unity. We all have unity because we're in Father and we're in His Son. And so we have that unity. And, but the blood of the Lamb, I learned that when I came here was the importance of the blood of the Lamb. That the importance of the blood of Jesus. And that His, and that his blood is enough. That His blood can heal. His blood can restore. His blood can redeem. That it is so powerful. It is as powerful as it was on the cross as it is today. And I learned that as when I went through my, um, my, my chemo journey. And then another thing I want to say is the other reason that our testimony is so important because it tells others what God has done in our life. It's, it's to, and, and how important that is. And it grips another person's faith. Have you ever had somebody give you a testimony and it grips your faith? It can grip your faith, it can strengthen your faith, and it can push you to take hold and grab what God has for you. Because what God has for someone else, God has for you. And I love how, uh, I love um, what Jana says, is that in the kingdom, like if God gives, gives, you know, as I press into God to heal me, Somebody else can press into God to heal them. And guess what? There's enough healing for them, and there's enough healing for me, and there's enough healing for you, and the healing never runs out. And that's what's so powerful, is, is, that, is having that. So God's power can help heal and change anybody's life. I know this. Now, oops. Now, both... Um, in John 10 and in John 14, the Pharisees were leaders, and they were talking to, um, asking Yeshua questions, and so was Philip. And what I love is that um, as, God, as Jesus did his teaching, that he, te he can teach to two different groups of people and deliver the same message, but at the same time, he can teach them in two different ways. Of what two different? So the leaders needed to hear from him in one way, and Philip, his friend, needed to hear a, something different from God, and that he can do that. That's why he's, he's so powerful. We can all be here, and when we get done, Jan and Garrett, when they go home, they're going to hear two different things, and God is going to be speaking to them two different ways, because that's what He does. And what I love about that is that we all need to be trained. So he's always training us. He's wanting to train us all the time. And so the, my testimony, um, so the importance of our testimony is super important. Now the gentleman who wrote the book, Art Matthias, his testimony came from his sister who had uh, breast cancer. And she called him on the phone and she told him, you know what, I've been given this diagnosis but I gotta tell you, I've just learned this teaching, and as I forgave people in our family, I was healed. And, they, and uh, the doctor's reports to Art weren't looking good. It was pretty bad. And so he said, you know what, I'm gonna try that. And he tried it, and he was healed. Art was healed. And so um, our testimony is important because it encourages people to push into Father God, to, put, to to uh, try it his way, to try it his way instead of the way we've been trying to try it. And that, when we, if, you, if you take that risk, he has so much, so much to show, to show us. 
So, um, how did I, I'm going to just tell you, how did I get my testimony? I just want to tell every one of you here that the thing that came with my testimony was a four-letter word called pain. I was in so much pain, and that's what brought me to these doors. And as I came through the doors, and I said, you know what, my, I just do not have the peace that I know that I've seen people that I love have, no matter what's happening around them. And I, I need that peace. I don't need it. I, I want it, and I need it. I want that peace, regardless of what's happening in my life. And I came into the doors. That's what brought me here. And when I came in here, I started to do things exactly as was um, prescribed to me by my counselor. And I started reading the book, and I used that bookmark. Um, it's a four-part bookmark, but it has the blood of Jesus. It's a forgiveness and a repentance. It's asking to hear God's voice, and as I did that, I started to see God move. And that's what Robert was talking about, the obedience if you hold to my teachings, if you follow my ways. And it was a way I'd never been instructed before. It was a way I had never operated. And four months into that was when I got the cancer diagnosis. And I remember that, I will still, I still remember that as clear as day of the thankfulness I had that I came through these doors. And the thankfulness that, um, that I said yes to doing it this way in my end trying to have my peace given back to me because I had already set up another counselor in town. I had already interviewed and was going to go to another counselor and I decided to try it this way and it was it totally rocked my world. Totally rocked my world. And um, in that pain, um, you know, I had many you know, there was many things that I could have stayed in in my pain. I could have stayed in looking at all of the people that I loved who had died in addiction, including within my family. I could have looked at pains of all different sorts of the brokenness in my family. I could have stayed in all of that. But what happened was um, God started to put dreams and visions in me. He put, uh, he put a verse, Psalm 104, right in the middle of, the, of going through chemo. You know, why would God put, enter my gates with thanksgiving in your mouth and enter my courts with praise in the middle of going through chemo? What kind of God would do that? You know what kind of God does that? The God that loves me. The God that wants to show me that no matter what's going on in your life, that you enter my gates with thanksgiving in your mouth. You enter my courts with praise. And as I did that, God opened doors that I never thought he would. He opened doors. He let me speak to people I never thought he would let me speak to. He healed my relationships and my family. He gave me precious, precious friends who did holy hikes with me, who we saw people within our family redeemed. And it took me away from me no longer trying to fix the situations, trying to control or manipulate anything. It took me to a complete new rawness and who God was and who he and how much he loved me. When Dave was t talking to this group of people this last week about his testimony, he used the word reset and he said, you know, God, I got, I got a reset. I got to hit the reset button in my life. And that's how I felt when I came and I said, I got I to gotta do the reset button and I said yes to it. So our testimony is uh, super powerful. And so we're going to look now. That was my testimony. He, and all of us, he wants us all to have a testimony. What you do today, what God is doing today for you in your testimony. One of the things that happened today that was really good in my life today, Sean, was that <laughs> um, I spent the night with my family last night. And um, I got a grandson, and he's in a lot of pain, and he hasn't been eating. And um, so I started praying for him. And we woke up this morning, and... Um, you know, he's eaten more today than he has in the last five days. You know, that's my God. That's who he is. And that testimony for me is powerful because he loves me and he loves my grandchildren. And um, I got to share with my family, you know, hey, I'm praying. I'm praying for, um, I'm praying for my grandbabies. So the testimony of Jesus is he came to do the works of the Father. And I 
don't have that word do um, in, in bold, but it's a do it. You know, that we can know what the works of God wants us. We can know what the Ten Commandments are, but do it. But it's the doing in it that brings us um, a personal relationship, freedom, um, and that he came to show us who the Father really is and what his will is by doing his work. Jesus defended his Father, and he did that in, in, because he wanted people to know that his Father cared for them. And he did it by how he handled his, the situations. He wanted them to know that he wasn't a distant God. Our God is not distant. He's not full of vengeance. He's not a God who's sitting up on a throne with big judgment um, batons. Um, he's a personal God. He's a personal God. Um, so what are, the, what are um, Father God's uh, works? The Father sent his son, Yeshua, to preach the gospel to save the lost so that we can all be redeemed. That's his will. He wants every one of us to come to know him. He wants every one of us to be redeemed from our sins. And, he, and, and that happens when we ask his son um, to forgive us for living life our way. And that's what really shit made that mindset shift in me when I came here, is that I stopped trying to live life my way. I, I stopped trying to fix my life. Because when you get a diagnosis of cancer, you can't fix it. <coughs> and any doctor you go to will tell you they can't heal you. They'll tell you that. We can do the best we can, but we can't heal you. And so when I was in a place where there was only one who could heal me, and it wasn't me, and it wasn't any doctor, I knew there was only one that could help me, and his name was Elohim, Father God in heaven. And I pushed into him and said, heal me and help me. And I, I love the testimony that came out of that because, you know, I asked God to heal me and he could have given me a miracle. He could have given me an automatic miracle and I could have went into the doctor and the cancer could have been gone and that could have been it. But he healed me. He healed my heart. He strengthened my faith in who he was. And it was in the pain that I changed. And I'm so thankful. So when people ask me, they could kind of give me a strange look sometimes because I say it's the best thing that happened to me. And they're like, how could that be the best thing that could ever happen to you? But um, I know now where I'm going when I die. And I know that um, I'm going to be with my father. And that, to me, means more than a miracle because it's healing of my, of my soul and that I represent him that I got to represent God before I left. See, we are a representation and advertisement of uh, who he is and his goodness and how we live our life. And before I came here, my life had good pieces of advertisement in it, but it wasn't the true advertisement. And today, through learning and practicing living in forgiveness and repentance, I get to represent him and show him and honor him. So he sent um, his son to, to redeem all of us. And when we are ready to give, let him be king of our heart instead of ourselves being king of our heart, came to heal the brokenhearted and to deliver those in bondage and captivity and to heal the blind and sick and to destroy all the works of the enemy, not some of the works of the enemy, all the works of the enemy. And all of these things up here are good. These are all good. God is good. His nature is good. And to bring abundant life. So how did he how did his son Jesus uh, Yeshua do his work? He taught and he demonstrated repentance and forgiveness because he wanted to teach us um, how to do repentance and how to forgive. And he walked that out. Um, he cast out demons and he healed all manner of disease. In John 4, I just want to share just a couple things from his word about what he's done. He healed the woman out of John 4 who was looking for love in all the wrong places. 
I know I've looked for love in many wrong places <laughs> in many years of my life. And she was so excited that she ran and told the men of her village about Jesus and what he did. And they believed in him too. Well, her community, because of her change, was, uh, was changed for him. And Jesus used that conversation to talk to the people because she brought them out to meet him because they wanted to meet him and they asked him, can you please stay for two days? Can you stay with us for a couple days and teach us? And uh, when he got done, he, they said, we no longer trust because of what you said because we have heard for ourselves and we know indeed that this man really is the savior of the world. So Father wants us to take our testimony and give it to somebody else and then for them to have a personal experience with him. That's his heart for us. He took a tax collector named Zacchaeus who had swindled his way to riches. So he showed us by um, demonstrating forgiveness. He took a man who was in sin and he showed us how to love people around us who are in sin. And Zacchaeus had swindled his way to riches, and he loved him. He knocked on the door of Zacchaeus' heart, and Zacchaeus let him in. What do you think that encounter would have been like to move? Um, what kind of encounter would you need in your life for you to be moved like Zacchaeus was moved? After, his after Zacchaeus' encounter with God, he gave half of his possessions to the poor. And he told Jesus if he had defrauded anyone of anything, he would give it back four times. That is a radical encounter with our God. He let a prostitute bathe his feet with her tears during dinner. Do you think that maybe she would have had an impact on women that she had influence in, in relationships with? Yeah. Right? So all of us have gone through different things in our lives. And he, and. Um, he wants us to walk out that love, showing people uh, what he's done for us. He wants us to show people and to um, help them understand that our God casts out demons, that he can heal us of any disease, and that he can raise the dead. Now, I've not personally seen anybody be raised from the dead. I've heard testimonies about it but I've seen people whose dead hearts have been raised. And he did many other acts that destroyed the works of um, the devil. So the testimony of Jesus um, is that there is power in, in his testimony. And he says, if I do not do the works of my father, do not believe me. And Jesus said unto him, unto him he that hath seen me has seen me the Father. So uh, the Bible and the writings in the Bible are alive today as they were 10, 20, 1,000 years ago. The Bible of God's Word and His uh, truth is life because the Spirit of God never dies. And His Spirit is alive. So we can trust in the testimony of uh, Yeshua. For I and my Father are one, and for this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the enemy. All right, so he's still... Re Another way that he re revealed the Father was that for him, he wants us to know that our understanding of who God the Father is and what his will, his will on earth is must be formed by who Jesus is and what he did. If it is not, then we have fallen into a trap set by the enemy. So my question is, who is Jesus? Who is Yeshua to you? Because Yeshua becomes what or who that you say that he is. Okay. In John 12, 14, 12, 47, it says, I have not come to judge the world, but to save it. And that word save is body, mind, and soul. It's the sozo healing. Um, he has come to save us. Okay. So our understanding of who he is is very important. And Father God is a father to us. So our Heavenly Father is nothing like our earthly father. 
And so many of us, depending on our relationship with our earthly father, no matter how good it was, could never compare to our relationship with our heavenly father, ever. And no earthly father is perfect. There is only one um, who is perfect. So what I want to do is I want to, I want to go ahead and um, I just want to demonstrate one of the way, the way that we pray here. And so as I was getting ready and prepping for this lesson, I was thinking about earthly fathers and, heaven, and our heavenly father. And many times how our relationship was with our earthly father, um, a lot of times will mirror our relationship with our heavenly father. So if there's been disappointment or abandonment in our relationship with our earthly father, those are just two that just came to my mind that can transfer over to our relationship with our Heavenly Father. And so what I would like to do is I would like to lead you through a forgiveness and a repentance prayer. And the first part is I'd like to lead you through a forgiveness prayer to forgive your earthly father for any way that he hurt you, or any way that um, you have a memory where there's pain in it. And I'm going to lead you just through it very, through it very specifically. And then we'll finish it in the middle with a repentance prayer, okay? And if this is not for you, if you could please pray for somebody here, um, that would be just to intercede for them, all right? All right. Repeat, repeat after me out loud. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, I purpose and I choose with my free will. I purpose and choose with my free will. To, to forgive my dad. To forgive my dad. Four, and just go ahead and put it in. I release my dad. I release my dad. His debt is paid. His debt is paid. He owes me nothing. He owes me nothing. And Father God, I ask that you would forgive me. Father God, I ask that you would forgive me. For any way, for any way, that the way my father treated me here, the way my father treated me here, that I have believed that that is how you treat me. I believe that that's how you treat me. Father God, I ask that you would forgive me. Father God, I ask that you would forgive me. For me living out. For me living out. Your mistruth. Your mistruth. About who you are. About who you are. And in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I cancel all of Satan's authority over me. I cancel all of Satan's authority over me. In this situation with my dad. In this situation. And because you have forgiven me, I forgive myself. Because you have forgiven me, I forgive myself. Father, wash me with your son's blood. Father, wash me with your son's blood. Heal my broken heart. Heal my broken heart. And show me your truth to set me free. Would anybody like to share? I got the 
picture that when he washes us clean, he washes us whiter than snow. It's a good word. Yes, he does. It's his promise. Um, I kind of went through a prayer like this uh, a while back on my own because uh -huh. I was reading the book and I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden this realization came that I was, I've been rejecting God's love mm -hmm. and thinking that earthly love is better. So I had to grieve, mm -hmm. and it was like a real aha moment. I don't know how it, I don't know, it was something I was reading in the book. Okay. But it was like, Lord, how could I, I, I mean, I'm rejecting his love and saying, I want the second you know, the second level on, at, on at Earth. Earth. Mm -hmm. And it was like second place, mm -hmm. you know, but he's offering me his, his love. Mm -hmm. perfect love. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, no, 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 I don't want it. I know, oh, I know how it came about. Um, Art Matthias was talking about uh, we are his bride. Mm -hmm. And that, I kept thinking to myself, uh, that kind of, something irks me about that. You know, it was irking me. Like, I'm like, why, 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 why is this? And so anyway, as I processed it, I realized I was going, no, no, no. I don't really, I don't want your love. I want an earthly love. Mm -hmm. And it was like a slap in God's face. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I came to a realization through that, that, that we are the bride. Right. And I'm like, I don't want to be his bride. Right. You know what I mean? I'm like an earthly bride, you mm -hmm. know? So it was like... Wow, how can I be like? I and mean, I really grieved. Mm -hmm. You know, if I had done it here, I'd probably be grieving. But it was like I did it because I, the Lord, you know, it was my heart. He was convicting me. But anyway, I love what um, Alice is talking about because what she's talking about, what I learned here, was listening to God's voice, and she let Him talk to her about how. Um, in case you didn't hear this online, about how she was rejecting his love and that what she wanted was to have an earthly love, like what his love was like, and that, that she was um, dissatisfied with that. And through that, God revealed to her what she was doing. And that's what he does is he revealed to her at the same time he was convicting her and teaching her and helping her and when she brought it to him he healed her of it and that's what i learned when i came here it was sitting in the presence of god and i didn't really wasn't able to hear god's voice when i first came here but i learned that he's always i learned when i came here a lot of times it's my first response and what is that response is it a confirmation is it you know, many times in my prayers, I would just feel his peace. That's a big deal, to feel God's peace, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's a big deal to hear, to, you, you know, to, hear, to have something sobering happen, like what happened to Alice, and it's just in front of you, but there's not necessarily sometimes words with it. It's just mm -hmm. all in front of you, and it just is just downloaded to you, and you respond to him. That's God's voice. God's voice is can come through a, um, a verse, it can come through another prayer, like oh, that's what happened with Alice. And that's how, that's, that's who he is. And if I would hear a voice that was a condemning voice, then I knew that that wasn't my God. And so that's how I learned to tell the difference in the voices that were going on inside of my head. And I would say, I'm not going to listen to that voice, because that's not the voice of my, um, Savior. <clears throat> so there's many times that the way that we have been raised that have brought untru untruths to us about our dad on earth and it becomes twisted and God wants to, to take all of that and untwist it and so asking him as, as you go through the week you know reveal to me ways that I've rejected your love or I've said no to you because I haven't been happy or satisfied with it. When yeah. I was <laughs> before this class, I was actually in the car reading mm -hmm. um, Oswald Chambers' a devotion, and a 
read you a little snippet. It says, the, the call of God is not just for a select few, but for everyone. Whether I hear God's call or not depends on the condition of my ears. And exactly what I hear depends upon my spiritual attitude. Depends on my what? Spiritual attitude. My spiritual attitude. <laughs> Whether or not we want to hear mm -hmm. his calling on. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Say, this can also be with your mother, too. Oh, yeah. So I also did a thing with my mother. I mean, I don't know what the Lord was doing at this point, but that I he, he knew what he was doing. He, I mean, he, knew, he, knew, he knew what he was doing, but it was also, um, you don't believe that, uh, I don't know, you know, if, if there's inconsistent, inconsistent parenting, if you don't have your needs met consistently, then you don't think, well, well you know, your needs would be met. But the thing is, <laughs> Jesus was like, that's the reason why you don't think I'll meet your needs. It was because I was believing mm -hmm. what my, you know, my mother. So it could be with your other parent too. It could be I, with your father. I like what Alice is talking about, that parents have inconsistency in how they parent. But that our ultimate parent, father, parents us all the same. It's, 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 it's. It's exactly, his, his ways do not change. His walking in righteousness does not change. There, he never changes. And, but yes, our, our earthly parents can be inconsistent with us. And it can be the mother or the father. So, well, I'm just gonna back up a little bit and we're gonna be talking about what the works um, of the enemy are. And um, before I came here, um, I didn't really want, I had a belief, I had a, um, a, I believed a lie that the enemy couldn't touch me. So I walked around for a long time as a believer, pretty grumbling and had a lot of unforgiveness, a lot of hatred, right? But I didn't believe that he could touch me. Did, little did I know that he was touching me. He was having influence. I didn't believe that I, that I could be saved, sealed, um, for an eternity with, my, with him, but at the same time have um, oppression and be, and be affected by the enemy. But I will tell you as being one of the first believers in my family that I was one of the most unapproachable people in my family. People could not come and talk to me or ask me anything because I had, I was a very, I judged a lot. So I had a pretty, I was pretty critical. And so even though I said I had, I was walking in my relationship with God, I wasn't producing the fruit. So my walk was dead. I wasn't producing his fruit in my life. And so, and I, and that was one of the belief systems that was, uh, that I was following was that he couldn't touch me, but I was not, um, I was living out that lie. So the works of the enemy is, was, uh, now today, I do know that I can be in God's kingdom, like if I'm in the kingdom, because I teach children at church here, we have a kingdom rug, and our kingdom rug is gold. So it pops out, and we tell everybody who says yes to Jesus and gives her heart to him, come on into the kingdom. But as we live our life, that we can step out of the kingdom, and we can get into what Kathy says, the swamp, or we get out of the kingdom. But we can get back into the kingdom if we want. And I didn't know that, that that's where I was living. Um, but today I do know that, and I can get back and have his peace. I don't have to stay in condemnation. I can. I don't. I don't live in shame. I will sometimes be repenting um, and asking God to forgive me and to help me, but I don't live there. I don't stay there because that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants me to say yes to the temptation, whatever it is, and then he wants to take me further than I want to go and keep me there longer than I want to be there and torture me. And but today I know that that I am not perfect, I am being perfected, and that 
when I get hooked, that I can get back into his kingdom, right? And ask God to help me with it. Well, the, another work that I, because of that, now I know there's things that, that have been revealed to me, and one of them is, is the way that the enemy belittled and blamed God, and he did that from the very beginning in Genesis 3. He lured Eve with a conversation. And many of my own temptations in my life were lured in a conversation and in my own, and in my own um, thinking. And I, we don't know, it doesn't say how many conversations that occurred um, with Eve, but that what happened was is that he conversed uh, with her. And he does that also. He'll have a conversation or he'll put thoughts in our mind, and then it's what we do with those truths, okay? So when I would have any kind of a thought during my chemo journey of what kind of God would give you cancer, I knew that was an untruth because I know that disease does not come from God. And so I was prepared to be able to say, that thought is not from my God. And I'm not going to even in any way um, start to uh, think about that thought. I'm not going to go down and start thinking about that, okay? Because I'm not going to question my father's love. All right? The other one is, the other works of the devil, one of, another one is the works of the flesh, and this is out of Galatians. And so I'm just going to read through that to you because I feel that it's really important. One of them is unholy sexual, sexual activity. God wants us to have sex, a healthy sexual relationship his way. He made us and designed us for relationship, okay? But uh, the works of the flesh um, is the enemy wants to tempt us and make us believe it's okay to have unholy sexual activities. That it's okay to put things in our body to get peace or acceptance from others or to feel good or any kind of relief. God wants us to go to him for that. He wants us to go to him to have to get our peace or to have relief or or to be accepted, right? Um, the enemy wants us out of Galatians to feud with one another. Our God wants us to reconcile. The enemy wants us to choose anger, and Father God wants us to choose His peace. The enemy wants us to be selfish, me, 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 me. But the, our God wants us to be the giver. And then he wants us to create disagreements or discord, but our Father wants us to create harmony. And the enemy wants us to be envious, but Father God wants us to be grateful. And so those are the works of the flesh that are out of Galatians 5, 19 through 21. And I learned, especially through the envy, um, the selfishness, um, learning about having holy activity, sexual activity to do it God's way, to choose peace, that I learned that by coming here in these rooms. I learned that through um, um, take and saying no to him. Uh, the works of the enemy is deceptions and false religions. So the enemy has been a part of designing Decept, uh, false religions. He's done 4,200 religions. We have to, we get to choose from. Just inside of our faith, there's 43,000 different types of denominations within the Christian faith that you can choose from. So he is, he is um, the founder of that. He wants uh, his works is to bring false doctrine. He wants us to be confused about who he is. He wants us to be, he doesn't, he wants us to do the, um, what do I call it? The golden corral faith. You go in and you take a little bit of this, and I'll take a little bit of that, and I'll take a little bit of this. And that's what, how I'm going to create my relationship with God. He wants us to live out of false doctrine. Because in God's word, it says to follow his ways. We don't get to be the chooser, right? But we think we get to choose. Well, we can choose it, but in it is a lot of pain. All right? He wants us to accuse the works of the enemy is to accuse the brethren right the enemy want, wants to accuse us but you know what our god he doesn't pick us apart the enemy picks us apart right he wants to help us when we struggle i was talking to a really good friend on the phone and um, she's picking herself apart this week 
and she's putting herself down a lot. And I said, wow, you putting yourself down? And she's like, I said, are you, are you, you know, talking death over yourself? And she's like, yeah. And I said, hey, let's, how about if we stop right now? And she might even be watching right now. And I said, hey, let's stop right now. And let's bless, let's, how about if we bless you? Let's just start blessing you, right? Because we know when we are together that we are to encourage one another and help one another. And I know she's going to think about that. And I know that she loves Father God. And I know that right now that she is listening to the lie. She's listening to the liar who's wanting her to believe that she's not worthy. Wanting to lead her into bitterness and into self-bitterness towards herself. The worst of the enemy is any and all temptation. But our God helps us to get away from temptation. Some other ones is the persecuting of Christians. Oh, and that is the way that we put other believers down. The way that we, um, you know, with our words, the, what, how, what we, how we can persecute them, how we can ruin them with our words. Right, But our God wants us to help set other people free through spiritual, and do we do that through spiritual warfare? He uh, uses that one in the, in the fruits of the Spirit, which I learned about, about the peace, joy, gentleness, or having gentleness, kindness, a long-suffering, and the very last one is called self-control, where you don't speak necessarily. And I learned that. That has saved me many times from um, having a lot of painful conversations because I have used my self-control. I've asked God, help me with my self-control, strengthen my self-control, right? He wants his, uh, the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. God, our Father God wants to give us life. The enemy wants us to, he wants to kill our relationship with Father God, with others, and with ourselves. He causes sickness and disease, right? Sometimes we know that we live in a fallen world. Sometimes I know that when I went through the chemo and I was given the label of it, the disease, um, that um, I knew that it did not come from God. I know that I live in a fallen world. I know that I have, that I have done things in my life that... Um, created my immune system to be really compromised. That I had a lot of stress in my life. It was being manifested in my body. I had uh, gut problems. I had fever blisters. Um, I had a lot of anxiety. And I know all of that compromised my immune system. That left me vulnerable to sicknesses. Was that, is that what caused my can the cancer that was given to me? I can't answer that. right? But this is what I do know is that God healed me from it. And that, I wa and that I learned how to forgive others and I learned how to forgive myself. And that the enemy ca uh, causes infirmities, but our God gives us a sound mind out of Second Timothy. Causes storms and death and he hinders prayers. In Daniel 10, it's, uh, when Daniel was praying, Michael, the angel, was prevented from coming to talk to Daniel for 21 days. So... The enemy can hinder our prayers, right? That's why we, it says in God's word that we are to pray continually. And if you don't see it happening, you don't see uh, God moving, don't stop praying. You continually, you continually, continually pray. So here at Wellspring, we teach it, so the ways that the works of the enemy can come at us are through unforgiveness towards others and ourselves, where we compare or we compete, right? Ways that we um, say yes to rejection, because we all know that God that uh, God's son was rejected. We will be rejected. We don't have to receive the rejection, but there that will happen. That it comes through fear, living out fear. Um, and I I had no idea that fear was um, a sin. 
I thought everybody was afraid. I thought it was a normal thing that happened. I thought it was normal that people hurt, when people hurt your feelings, that you held a record of their wrongs and you didn't, you know, that when you were ready, you, you could let it go. When I was ready to let it go, well, God wants me to let, wants me to forgive immediately. So I learned coming here that his ways are very opposite of what I was, what I learned, that I learned walking out ways that were from the enemy, but God showed me how to forgive um, right away. Okay? So my question is, what are your works? Because in Matthew 16, 27, it says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. And so when I think about the word works, and I started studying about that. That is our sanctification, right? It's our sanctification. So that is about living out the forgiveness and living out uh, repentance, right? And so um, I can ask myself, how, how have I loved you today, God? And how have I loved others? And how have I loved myself? And ask him to show me. And so it is forgiveness and repentance in action. All right, so one of the things I'm going to ask right now, I'm just going to stop, is any testimony of anybody here that, can, that would like to share any way that you guys have forgiven or you've asked God to forgive you where you have seen his power work in your life through this class, um, through your reading, through your prayer time. did not get to ask you at the beginning because I like to bring testimony and so I'm going to bring it in right now. If you... Yeah. So did you just ask... Anybody here? Would any, do, do any of you have a, a testimony that you would like to uh -huh. share about how you have uh, lived out the sanctification in your life? Okay. Today, it could be something today. Well, for me, it's been like a process, of course, but... Um, and your duty, right? Yeah, okay. I started Judy. coming here last year, and I was a mess, of course, even though I've been a Christian for many years, and I had a really hard relationship with my husband at the time, and I, I started um, doing all the forgiveness prayers and mm -hmm. coming and reading everything and doing all the prayers. And, Along with a few other things that I did, which included um, more prayer and more worship. I have a special worship CD I like. It's like an hour about, yeah. and I, I do that three or four or five times a week, whatever. And so going through the book thoroughly, and I'm still doing it. I'm reading everything. I'm looking up every scripture. Um, doing all the forgiveness prayers mm -hmm. that I can think of. Doing the worship, the prayer. Anyway, it just turned everything around. Everything's really good now with my husband and I. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is a huge testimony. That would be like a testimony, like what we love here at, at Wellspring is that when you have a testimony, write to us. Like we love to share that. We share testimonies online. We share testimonies down in the, in the when we're in, in a fellowship together because that is powerful to watch. To watch. God, when you let God transform you, when you let him help you, and you do it his way, that's really powerful, Judy. Yeah, you have to get, well, I had to get to the <laughs> point where I was desperate, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, I didn't want a divorce, I didn't want to mm -hmm. lose my husband, I didn't want that kind of life. Right. And that's when I realized I had to do some changing. <laughs> yeah, that's good, that's good. I love and that. There are, you know, tools out there. So we have um, somebody, um, if you're online, who used the Biblical Foundations of Freedom specifically in forgiving that has restored her marriage. I love that. Anybody else want to share? Then, uh, did you need to go? Um, Jenny, you want to go? <laughs> Thank you. That's very sweet of you. <laughs> um, I've been um, just, um, I don't know if anybody else has gone through this. It's like, there's so much confusion with this COVID. So I've had to, for me, I've had to step back mm -hmm. like this and forgive like 
put in people around me and mm -hmm. create and create peace through mm -hmm. the, everything that's going on and it's it's um, you know you want to be kind of more action and it's like you're going like this and like you just gotta back up <laughs> you know to have you know create that peace. People understanding. So. That's really good. It's a good word about um, how we can let situations or what we see around us affect us and steal our peace. And that through forgiving and asking God to forgive us to step back, you know, that she step. You know, I love that because I learned here that all of our thoughts, that we have three minutes to respond to every thought that comes. That comes to us, and how we how we choose to react or respond. That's a long. That's a good time. That's a good amount of time to back, slow down, back up, and then to respond to keep God's peace in our life. And it's a good time to be practicing that right now, with everything that is going on around us, to be practicing that peace and keeping our eyes on our uh, on our Maker, keeping our eyes on Him and not on the situations around us, right? That's where he wants us to have our gaze right now, is on him. That's a good word. I'll, I'll say something. Well, thank you, Jen. <laughs> I had to tease Jen because I don't think I've ever heard her share something when you said that. So. Okay, well, Jen. to that, okay. I came, I found this class, oddly, <laughs> and then um, came for a couple of weeks and then I found myself for several weeks sitting through these classes going, man, so-and-so needs to come to this class. So-and-so <laughs> needs to come to this class. Man, so-and-so would really benefit from this class. And it wasn't until my other half started coming, and it was actually a couple weeks into that on, a, on the drive home <coughs> that he pointed out something that maybe I needed to think about in my life. Mm -hmm. And that's when it started to, it stopped from so-and-so needs this right. class to, okay, how can I really incorporate this into my life mm -hmm. and not think about everybody else that needs it. Right. <laughs> so. that that's, a good that's a good word. So, there we go. That's God's revelation. That's, that's, that's called his revelation. Yeah. His that's revelation. Yeah, yeah, so sure. good. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. good. That's a good word, Jen. Thank you. Anybody else want to share? I have a, uh, I mean, I, I've got this admittedly passive aggressive way of dealing with things. I mean, I'm easy to go back and say, okay, hey, let's, let's make this right. You know, mm -hmm. I want to forgive you. And that's what I would do outwardly because I want to have the idea that, you know, I have to forgive for Jesus to forgive me. Right. But, I would wear it where it is really bad. I mean, I, I mean with everyone, with people I work with, with my family members, especially my teenagers. Mm -hmm. I would just continually to wear this. And it, I mean, to say that it made me sick, it would be an understatement. Mm -hmm. But I felt like, you know, well, look, I have forgiven. I have went and I've, I, I have done, and I have went and I've forgiven. I went and tried to make things right. I've done what I could do. Right. But deep down inside, I didn't want to. I mean, I didn't, inside of myself, I still had this resentment. And I still had these things that, uh, that would just pick at me and hit at me. Basically, I believe in a foothold for the enemy right. to keep working. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I mean, who wouldn't? You know, if, you, if your teenager curses you out on me, who wouldn't get upset about that? Exactly. Who wouldn't get offended? That's good. I, I am it right, right? <laughs> Ask anyone. <laughs> so, and I, I, I mean, to do this, uh, I learned, you know, mm -hmm. that old thing. You, you can, the whole idea that I can choose, mm -hmm. that I do have, have a, a that I do, that I can say, I do choose. I choose to not wear this. I choose not to to sit and put on a facade, but to actually say, you know, I don't have to worry about this. I don't have to be resentful. I don't have to right. have this, uh, to, to, to keep this cloud up and, and, and honestly live, live a lie, a lie mm -hmm. with that. Mm -hmm. 
it's totally different because now you don't have to go in and join up the jibs or putting down a person that slighted you because everyone else is doing it. Right. You don't have to join in and feel like you've got to go and talk and back 40 about, about everything, that you really actually let it go, that you actually free yourself from it. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's what I got. It's a good word. It's a good word. So what? <coughs> Transform, transformation. So what, it was more that, that I, I mean, as Christians, you know, you go and you forgive, and you don't really feel like forgiving, but what was the pivotal point that you, you used the word, I choose to forgive? I, I didn't really... Can you repeat that part? Completely understand what the issue was. I, I once, uh, for instance, I went on a, uh, a road trip with someone. We, uh, we had a real, I mean, it was horrible. We had a real confrontation. Uh, I felt that was right. He felt he was right. Uh, we were very angry at each other, both of us. I, I, especially me. I mean, he actually came to me and tried to talk to me. But we were angry at each other. I, about a week after that, I'm like, I can't live like this. He was right. We have to continue working with each other. I went and I told him, I said, I'm not saying I'm wrong. I'm not saying you're right. I'm just telling you that there's no reason for us to be angry with each other. And I said, again, I didn't continue speaking to him. I wouldn't go across. I wouldn't run across the street to throw a bucket of water on him if he was on fire because I just went on because that's kind of the way I would do things. And I thought I really thought, well, that's that's fine. I didn't understand why I would get that rile up in my my system with him or when I was assigned to work with him. And I was just trying to work through that. But deep down inside of me, I knew that was eating me up. I could feel it was eating me up. I couldn't understand why. I, would, I didn't do anything wrong. I, to this day, I really still don't feel like I did anything wrong. But I had to make a choice. I had to really make a choice that, you know what, I really do have to forgive him. I have to look past it. It doesn't matter whether I'm right or mm -hmm. whether I think I'm right. Mm -hmm. I have to look past it. I have to let go and say, you know what, I give that to God. Yeah. Yeah, I give it completely yeah. to him. Yeah. I completely give away my... Right. You gave up your right. Yeah. To, to be right. right. To be, to be right. Right. I have to, I have to, I have to do that. Yeah. 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 I like what Alice said too, piggybacking that she said you took it to a different level. It's more than just what we're taught when we grow up. It's like knowing that it's eating you up. It's in the, and it's eating up your relationship with God. And that, and that when you move into doing that, that you're the one who walks with the peace and the having the freedom. And that's, I love that because that's exactly what I learned here was that the way I respond will either bring God's kingdom or it, it can further his kingdom or it can stop his kingdom. And that as I pushed into it, that's what furthered his kingdom and restored my relationships with my family. That I took responsibility for all of the things that I did and how I hurt my mom. And I sat on the phone with her for an hour admitting, yes, I did that to you without defending myself. Mm -hmm. God told me, mm -hmm. I am your defender. You do not defend yourself. And, and because it was her reality, uh, was I a part of the pain? I absolutely was a part of the pain. My mom, I wanted my mother to hurt. I wanted my mom to feel the pain of what she had done to me as a child and what she had let me be exposed to, and I felt she owed me. And I'm telling you what, you guys, I hurt her and I hurt her for a long time. And so we had a very rocky relationship back and forth. It was not good. And it always would end up in this cycle of her telling me how I had hurt her and then we'd blow up and it was, it was just awful. So when I came here, I learned how to respond differently. When I sat there for that hour and I told her, you're right, you know, I'm sorry I did that. I'm sorry you did that. I am not kidding you. A week later, she called me crying, asking me to lead her through forgiveness prayers, to forgive her mother and father for physically abusing her because she couldn't carry the pain anymore. Mm -hmm. But it came with me being obedient and saying, I am sorry and I'm holding and I'm taking responsibility for my part. And so that's, that's his way. His ways are not. Dave actually, I'm just going to show this really quick. Dave was sharing, i got to share this, Dave, um, in front of this group of people that 
about how um, for his whole career he had built his career and um, and when he built his career there were two situations that happened in his career where he had to at the end where he had to confront he had to confront um, a cover-up and then he had to also confront somebody who felt that they had more power than anybody else that you know he would actually fire that he would actually um, come up against him and try to get him fired and when that happened his boss took his position away and gave him Dave calls it the position of paper clips the administrative instead of Dave being a leader over um, men and over what do you call it a leader over warriors. warriors thank you instead of being a leader over warriors he was a leader over paper clips and so what the so that's the position of being a, um, the captain or whatever of administration. But when he was obedient to doing what was right, knowing the risk that would be involved in it, and he did it anyways, his position was taken away from him. But God gave him a position that we never would have known of. And the position was is that anybody who needed to take a leave had to go through Dave, which in all of the 40 years where he worked, he had never experienced the opportunity to pray for people and to watch people get healed through his prayers. And he would never have done that if he wouldn't have had the administration position. So the very, sometimes the way that we think, you know, things work in God's kingdom, he does it, he'll flip it and do it very opposite. So the very thing that rose Dave to the power for God's kingdom was the very opposite way that he thought it would go. And so anyway, so that's, that's who our God is. That's who our God is, right? So he wants to use all of us. And some of the things that he gives us as overcomers is he promises us that we get to eat of the tree of life, that we will not be hurt in the second death, we get to eat of the hidden manna, and we receive um, a white stone, and he gives us a new name. Is that beautiful? Mm -hmm. Those are some of his. He has so many promises in his word. He gives us the power of nations, clothes us in white raiment, and he will confess our name before his father. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. And he will not blot out our name from the book, book of life which means that our name can be blotted out of the book of life, right? I do not want my name blotted out of the book of life. And that we get to sit in the throne with Jesus. So how do we do that? And I've been talking about it, kind of like filtering it in, and you guys have been sharing your testimony about how to do that. Um, it says in 2 Timothy 2.19, 19 through 21, this is out of the complete Jewish Bible. Nevertheless, nevertheless, God's firm foundation stands stamped with these words. The foundation, the, the, nevertheless, God's firm foundation stands stamped with these words. The Lord knows his own, and let everyone who claims he belongs to the Lord stand apart from wrongdoing. And what I really got out of that was that we stand. And that there's going to be wrongdoing going on all around us, but that we are to stand in the wrongdoing, but apart from it. And that people see us like um, how we respond. And um, I forgot your name. Wilkie. Wilkie? That, that when he talked about that you don't have to respond when people at your job want to start thrashing and saying things about other people. You can stand in that wrongdoing, but you can stand apart from it, All right? That when somebody goes home after that, those kind of situations, the, I will tell you, the way we respond, people remember. Well, I remember, you know, that Kinda, you know, she didn't say one word during that whole conversation, you know. I wonder, you know, wonder what's going on with that, you know. That that's what we are to do. That is how we stand to be a vessel of honor. That in a large house, and this is God's house, right, we're dishes and we're pots. 
and some of us are pots of gold and silver, but also wood and clay. And that some of us, some of us uh, as we live out our life, are meant for honorable use. That means that we can be used for honorable task. We're the good China. What? We're the good China. We're good China. I love that. That we can be the good China, right? And some of us will be um, used for dishonorable. By our own choice. By our own choice. And if a, but if a person keeps himself free of defilement by the latter, he will be a vessel set apart for honorable use by the master of the house and ready for every good work. And I take that right here, that you stand apart from wrongdoing. We live in this world. We don't get to, you know, we, we don't get to choose our family. You don't get to choose who you work with, but we get to stand apart. We don't get to choose who our neighbors are, but that we stand apart in the wrongdoing. That we represent and we advertise our God well in being a vessel of honor. So some of the, um, one of the lessons that I want to talk to you about is out of the Old Testament, out of Haggai, um, and that we can learn so much from the Old Testament. And that it's a time for us to rebuild the Lord's house. And I'm just so thankful that I got to rebuild my vessel, that God gave me a chance to do that when I came here. I'm so thankful for that. So who is the temple of the Lord? Um, in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, 16, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? So in the book, the lessons from Haggai is, Haggai was a prophet, and he went and God wanted him to speak to the people. And this, usually when prophets would go and speak, their, what their message was from God, they didn't want to hear it. They would get angry and they'd be, because they were rebelling against God, so they would get angry and they usually would kill the prophet. So, but Haggai was not killed, and the people listened to him. And his message was simple, it was straightforward, and um, he told them what they were living in and what they were doing against God. And through the physical act, he, um, because the temple had been um, put into ruins, but he had them rebuild the temple. And through their physical act of rebuilding, which is the same thing as, our, as us rebuilding our temple through obedience, that the people began to indicate a shift in their spiritual lives. And that that's what happens in us. That as we walk out that obedience, we can, we don't, it doesn't always feel like, oh, I feel like I'm in this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in this great spiritual, uh, living out this great spiritual life. But that there is a shift that happens. And it moved from devotion to themselves to the devotion of God. And when we devote our heart to God and we let him rebuild our vessel and we do the work in it, we let him because we are obedient to him, that our devotion towards him changes. So some, what are some of the questions that were asked um, let me just get to that. Um, you have so much, and you bring in little. So he, hey, guys, asking the people there questions. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You dress, but you're not warm. And you work, but you put your wages into a bag full of holes. And so all of these is about living a lifestyle. And the things that they did left these people feeling very empty and unfulfilled. Okay? And it all had to do with their choices. Right? And so these are lessons for us to learn about today. And so um, Haggai said, this is what God has told me. He wants us to rebuild our temple. Rebuild this temple, rebuild your temple, go to work. And when you choose to be obedient, I will be with you. Right? I learned that here. I was waiting and waiting and waiting for God to bless me and to deliver me. I, didn't, I had to switch around. It's a mathematical equation. It's called obedience, then the blessing. Mm -hmm. Not the blessing first, and then, I, and then I'm going to be obedient. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, that is, the, that is the, the, the way the path is out. So the same message that Jesus taught in, it was the same message that Jesus taught in Revelation. It's the same message that Paul taught in Timothy, was to do that. Okay? Um, 
Okay, so the same, the same one in Revelation 2.3. Let me tell you what that is so that you know. This is what he said. You left, you left your first love. You left your first love. Remember, God wants us to remember where we were when we finally turned to him. Right? And then he wants us to go back to that. He wants us to remember that we, he is our first love. And that the churches then, they had lost their first love. Okay? In 2 Timothy, it says, as you are obedient, not as you receive the blessing, but as you are obedient, he will awaken and strengthen you to walk in his ways and give you the mind of Christ. Okay? In 2 Timothy 1, 6, it says, For this reason I remind you to fan the flame, the gift of God. Okay? It's up to us to, flame, to, to uh, stir that. It's up to us to, flame, to fan the flame in him. And that we do that through obedience. Robert? Well, I'm thinking about this Jesus character <laughs> and how his words that I've come to understand and think about, if you love me, you will do my commandments. Yeah. Well, if supposedly Jesus loved his father, well, so if as Jesus loved his father, Jesus did his father's mm -hmm. commandments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and let's see where I'm going with this now. Uh, so, uh, hmm. <laughs> I'll I'll pick it up in a minute, uh, but it, it's going to follow that line that that uh, my rebuilding of of his temple means I'm going to. Oh, this is it. That uh, Jesus. Yeshua followed all of his commandments and he was obedient to them. Uh, and when did the blessing come? Uh, Yeshua, Jesus went through an act of dying. Right. And then he was, there was a blessing of a rising and a, and a position with his father at his father's right hand. So the, you know, the blessing doesn't necessarily. Uh, at least in Yeshua's circumstance, come right after, hey, I did good. Right. Uh, you know, he, he went through an act of, of dying, and, and then there was a blessing after that. So that's, that's a good. curious idea to me, that, that it's, you know, the blessing is, is not necessarily like obedience, blessing. Right, okay. It's okay. obedience. It's obedience, obedience. Endurance, okay. blessing. Mm -hmm. It's a blessing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kind of like recovering from cancer. Kind of like your yeah. testimony, Cindy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kind of have to walk through the fire. You know, so. Go ahead there. You know, it, in Haggai, when it says you, you know, you work and you've got right. nothing, you make money and you've got holes in your bag and you do this and you're not getting anything. So when you say you have choice, you're talking about choosing to be obedient? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's encouraging to me that obedience, and I think I heard it first from you, say, that obedience is his love language. Mm -hmm. His what? His love language. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of the five love languages? That's God's God's five love languages are obedience, obedience. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. I was going to say I, I, I haven't read that book. You know? So the, the, we're going to end here because I only have a couple minutes. I'm just going to finish with this slide. It's been an honor to be here with you guys tonight and be able to talk about our Savior. So the true, the part of the true purpose of our life is to go into perfection, right? None of us are perfect. Only He was perfect. But we are to uh, go on to being perfected. What is that? That's called maturing, right? He wants us to move away from like knowing like that uh, his that his son died for us, that you know that we give our life to him.
he wants to do like what Judy's talking about, what Wilkie talked about, what Jen talked about, the application, what Alice talked about. What I hear all of you guys talking about is the application of having him take you through situations in your everyday life that aren't, aren't always fun. He never said the journey was going to be fun. It's about honoring him in the journey. It's very time consuming. And it's and it's letting that it's letting him work in is letting him work in the pain. It's letting him work in the disappointment and responding his way and not our way. That's going on to perfection, okay? It is a spiritual battle. It is a spiritual battle. He wants us to uh, he wants us to um, the other thing I want to tell you is that to do, it says, to be holy as I am holy. To do that in those verses, to be good, to minister to others, do things for other people. One of the things that we study is Caroline Leaf. She's a brain scientist here who's a, an absolute radically in love with Jesus. Uh, she says that there's a, a statistic. This is my, I tell you, this is mine. When people who are sick, I was, when they reach out to others, which I did, and served other, others, those experiences brings a 68% increase in their own healing mm -hmm. versus just getting treatment. Mm -hmm. I also went to a, a doctor who told me there was a study of people that had heart conditions that lived longer when they stayed positive about their situation and didn't live in negativity. There's power in letting God work in you for you to live in shalom to live in joy, to live in that peace, to be an overcomer. That is what being an overcomer is, having victories over what I talked about in my situation, your situation, conflicts, conversations that we face in life. Um, how she, she talked about how to respond and step back about keeping her peace in this situation about what's going on in our lives, to become vessels of, of honor, living a life of forgiving and repenting. Lifestyle of forgiving. I forget, uh, you, you call it something, forgiving Kathy. Forgiving living. What is it? Forgiving living. Kathy calls it forgiving living. Mm -hmm. I love that. Forgiving living, right? By taking all of our thoughts captive, knowing that not all of our thoughts are our own, thank you, God, and that we do not have to agree with them, and they do not have to become who we are, and that we can just say, mm-mm, I'm not even going to be thinking about that thought. Right? And to destroy all the works of the enemy, temptations, any blaming, or any way we want to accuse people around us. Right? And to crucify or to die to sin. That's living a lifestyle that edifies his nature. When we say yes to God being the king of our heart, it's like moving in, it's like uh, relocating to a whole new world, a whole new land where we don't even know the language. And we have to learn his language. We are giving his nature, but we have to practice living his nature out. And so we do away with our old nature. We do away with the old way we lived, and we bring in his way. And that's what dying to sin is, is living life his way. So I'm going to end, and then next week we'll be... Dave will be teaching next week. So come back next week. And so let me bless you guys, and we're going to end. What chapter? It'll be chapter one. one, what is sin. Did you want to say something real quick, Robert? Uh, no. Okay, Father God, thank you for tonight, Lord. Thank you so much, Father, that you love us. We honor you. We bless your holy name. And we thank you, Father God, for sending your son, your perfect son, Father God, so that we could have a face-to-face relationship with you that father that we understand that lord that you want to bring your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven so father i i declare right now over every single person who's sitting here for your kingdom to come through them on this earth today father i pray that you put your spirit of boldness and courage in them and through them to speak and be your voice father god to change their neighborhood their work friendships, their relationships with their family, and God, that they would advertise you well. Father God, I pray that you would protect them. I pray, Father, for Holy Spirit, for your fire to move in them and stir them, Father God, in a way that pushes them. 
Father God, I pray that you would take them to places that they don't even aren't even aware of. Father, in their um, living in their life, in Yeshua's mighty name, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yeah.